Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of MMA and the third member of our broadcast team, the Diamond, Dustin Poirier. Diamond, welcome back, champ. Thanks for having me on, man. I always appreciate the uh, the invites. Always appreciate you, Dustin. How's everything going? How's your family, first of all, most important? Thank How's you for everybody? asking, man. Uh, family's great. My daughter just graduated kindergarten and uh, lost her first tooth, so... Life's moving, man. Everybody's great, though. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the Tooth Fairy visit the house? Yeah, for sure, man. I put a <laughs> bunch of ones to try to make her feel like she got more, but she's she's getting smart now. She can count and add them up now. <laughs> I was going to say, at the Diamond House, she probably got 100 of them. Yeah, right. Yeah. Come on. I put, I, I put IOUs under her pillow. <laughs> you're, thankfully, you're way past that day, and that's why we love you, and that's why the fans love you, quite frankly, is because you earned your way to where you got. You know, no short no short um, steps. You uh, truly, truly earned your way uh, the right way. Thanks. So, uh, I'm, I'm, proud, I'm proud of it, for sure. Yeah, you should be. You're, you're not only proud of it, the fans are proud of it. The fans obviously embrace you. We embrace you for that, for that character, for doing it that way. But you're better for it in, in many ways. You're more grateful, I'm sure, for what you have, more appreciative for what you have. And um, you're a better fighter because of it, because you weren't babied along, because you had to learn the things the hard way, so to speak. You had to take that trail um, with tough fights, where you got questions asked and questions answered, where, you know, it, it's, it's formed you into the fighter that you are. Do you ever think about that, about that trail, that, that journey, the way I just kind of described it? Yeah, I think about it all the time. I'm thankful for it. And like you said, a lot of questions got answered, but a lot of questions were asked uh, along the way. And, and and every fight is that like I'm, I learned so much and, and figure things out in these fights. And I'm sure the next one, you know, I'm going to learn more about the craft and about myself. You know, it kind of goes both ways. It's a two way street with that. Yeah, it is. You look great, by the way. You look you look strong. You look like maybe you've been doing some weights. I'm not sure. But you, you look you look a little big, but not big fat, but big, you know, and strong. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, probably about 185 pounds right now. I'm a little bit heavy, heavier yeah. than I usually am. Yeah. What do you walk around usually? I mean, you know, to give us a little bit of an idea. I would say anywhere between 180, 183. Like that's my waking up weight usually. Yeah. Yeah. Before you get ready for camp and all that stuff. Yeah. In camp, like, you know, mid, mid, oh, lost you. Uh, that's all right. In camp, camp didn't like, start yet, did it? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't have I don't have I don't have a fight. Um, no, no, I'm kidding. Camp. I threw a punch game at you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I slipped it. <laughs> there we go. I um in camp, like throughout the middle of camp, I'll probably be in the mid seventies, you know, and then I get down to like one seventy, one sixty eight for fight week and I cut that that water weight twelve pounds. When will camp start? I mean, if you know. I mean, where are you at? I mean, as far as an opponent, an idea for an opponent, you know, where are you at? I, I tell you, I wish I had an answer for you. I've been uh -huh. driving myself insane, man. I haven't fought in, it's going to be six months. Yeah. You know, I'm healthy and I'm, and I want to fight. So I just, I flew out here to Florida yesterday and I'm just going to stay here at the gym. My family's going to meet me at the end of the month. I'm just going to stay here training with my guys. I have a bunch of friends with fights coming up, so I'm going to help them prepare. And, and along with that, I'm going to get uh, prepared by helping them. So I know the phone's going to ring soon. I really wanted to fight at the end of July in Dallas, Texas, but We'll see, man. I, I have no clue who it is or if it's going to be 155 pounds or 170 pounds. Well, what would you prefer? Um, I got to, my wife was telling me before I left, she was like, go get out there, train for two weeks, eat healthy. You know, don't, don't starve yourself, eat healthy, get in a good routine and see what your weight is and then make a decision then. Cause if, 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 if I'm training once, once a day and then maybe do a couple two a days here and there and eat healthy and, and my weight's like 178, I'm going to just fight at 55. There's no, there's no reason these guys are going to be too big at 170. Would you rather take a money fight at 170 or, a, or a, a fight at 155 that gets you a step closer to a title shot or a big money fight, like big money at 170? That's a tough one, man. I'll probably take the money. Good for you. Very honest and practical and at this point in your career, uh, real and right. You know, I mean, that's where you're at, uh, you know, for your family. For You're not a spring chicken. You're not old. 
but right, <laughs> you you know you. I'm aging like I'm aging like a bag of milk. No, over here. no, you're good. You're good, Dustin. You you're healthy. You take care of yourself, but like I always say, you have some miles. When you're in your business, you're gonna have miles on the odometer. I mean, let's like face. like. Like like I've said before, uh, you know, I, I I still have a lot of tread on the tires, but I've been doing it a long time. I've been fighting since I was 18 years old. I've been in some battles, and and I every one of my fights pretty much is that. So um, I'm just trying to be strategic with these with these fights that uh that I'm going to continue to fight, and you know, I just want it to make sense not only financially but the opponent opponent wise, uh, to where it's an exciting fight. No, 100. percent Listen, you're in the right. To be in a position to choose a little bit, you earned that right. You earned that right by, uh, you know, by the taking the blows you took, taking the punishment you took, uh, going through it, persevering, uh, winning. I mean, you you earned that right. You earned that right to to make those choices. I appreciate it, but at the same time, all those things you just said, I'm willing and and ready to to go through all those things again. The the the, the punches the. You know, the pressure, all the stuff you just said, I'm, I'm, I love it. That's why you should continue fighting. That's all I needed to hear. If, if you didn't say that to me just now, then you should think about getting out because you, yeah. that has to be the mentality. Wouldn't you agree, Dustin? I mean, that when that stops being the mentality, truly, truly, for yourself, for the respect of the sport, you, everybody, it's time to it's time to say adios. After, after this last fight, you know, I had a lot of time to reflect and, and uh, a lot of quiet time to really think about the whole picture, the landscape of, of the division, my career, and, and, and everything. And I felt like I don't know when this happened or how it happened, but somewhere along the way, I got too comfortable. I started looking at this like it was, um, you know, athletics, like this was a sport, like I was going to a football game or, you know, th this isn't that, this is battle. This is war. I, and I've always had that mindset, but somewhere I, I feel like I lost it um, in the last, in the last camp, maybe, I don't know, but something was different. And I, I feel like I've, I found it again, just being back home, training by myself, you know, doing a lot of work in my own personal gym, just being alone. Let really. me ask you a question right off uh, of that. If you didn't find it, and this is the right question, I believe at least, if you didn't find what you just described, would you have come back? That's a tough question. Yeah, I, I think I would. I would continue to. I would have continued to fight, but my mindset would have been like an athletic venture. It would have been like an, I'm going to compete. That this isn't that. To I mean, it's different to everybody. Maybe to some people it is, and that's fine. But to me, to be at my best and in, in fighting, this is war. It has to be that in my mind, and I lost that. You know, I lost that. Uh, so, somewhere i wish i knew when it happened or how it happened but i'm just happy that I, i've uh realized it you know well, it, happened, I, I, it happened from success you know success brings the things that you fight for brings comfort it brings um comfort and a protection for your family you want to protect your family. I mean, right. that's where, you know, that's one of the roots of it. You want to protect your family. You want to take care of your family. You secure them. Uh, secure things that are important to you as far as feeling the way you need to feel as a person, as a man, um, you know, as a successful person. Uh, things that are put away from years ago, from years ago. And when you start knocking those things off the checklist, you know, and you start checking the boxes on, yeah, did that, yeah, did that, yeah, did that, got that. Um, you know what? You get to that place where what is the reason now, you know? Yeah. And you're human. I mean, but a lot of people go on for just the money. And, and that's where you got a problem. That that's where you have a problem as far as legacy, as far as 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 far as results, um, as far as being healthy. I mean, that's where you got a problem. But you did it the right way. You gave the right answers just now. You you uh, searched out uh, the right place. Yeah, yeah. And of course, all those other things have to be right. The money has to be right. Things have to make sense. But I, I'm genuinely looking forward to getting a contract, putting myself in training camp, trying to be my best and going out there and, and figuring this thing out in, in live time. You know, I, I look forward to that. That still gives me butterflies, those feelings, those thoughts of going out there and anything can happen. And, uh, 
it's a journey, man. It's a journey, but I, I want that. You have to still be that. You have to still be that, whatever monster. Yeah, you, you, I mean, to, and it's the. You, you still have to be that gladiator. You still have to be that where you you have a you you just have a desire and a want for that battle, for that search. Yeah. Hey guys, quick break to give a shout out to one of today's sponsors, Nord VPN, Virtual Private Network. When I'm traveling, I'm often using unsecured hotel or airport Wi-Fi, the networks at coffee shops, etc. Public Wi-Fis like these are notorious for getting your data hacked, which can be a nightmare. It's happened to me, it's happened to friends. Avoid all the BS by using NordVPN. It's easy to use, it doesn't slow down your connection, and you make sure all your data is private and protected. I even use it at home just to have an added layer of, layer of security and peace of mind. Peace of mind, sorry. Go to NordVPN slash Atlas to get 61% off a two-year NordVPN plan. 61%? Yikes. Uh, it's completely risk-free and Nord's and Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee is a no-brainer. Again, go to nordvpn.com slash atlas to get 61% off a two-year NordVPN plan. You know, it's a funny thing. I'm going to say I'm going to sway you off a little bit, but Cosimato, who I think was the, well, I, he was my mentor, so I think he was the greatest boxing mind of all time. But whatever, he was pretty damn good. And uh, he he grew up in a tough place in a section up in the Bronx, and he every time we go there to go down to Everlast, which had their factory down there, uh, we would it, me and him would drive down to buy you know equipment and stuff, and um, Bruckner Boulevard that area, and he would always make me go by his where he grew up, which was about a hundred times. So that's where I grew up. Across the street was Murderers Inc. Incorporated. They lived across the street. There's, I said, "Cuz I know, I I got it. I I got it." The last time we came down here, and the time before, and the time before that. But you know, he he's my guy, and I respect. I'm listening to kind of like listening to your grandfather tell the stories that you know you've heard a few times, and um, yeah. but it was great. So we go down there, and and he would, and then he would tell me all of a sudden. He always had a way of transitioning to something about, you know, that made sense in my business and in life. And he would say, and he used a hard sort of way of saying it, but he said, you know, when a gangster is no longer <laughs> gangster, but, you know, he, he grew up around that. So he said, I used to watch these guys. And when they no longer, when they reached what they wanted to reach, you know, comfort, you know, security, you know, where they were, where they were, they had the money, they had the cars, they had the, all the material things that they never had. And they had all that. All of a sudden, they lost the desire and what it took to be a gangster. <laughs> to be, you know, uh, and obviously we're not, we're not romanticizing that, that that's a good thing to be, but it's not a good thing. But he was making a point. That was their business. And when they no longer could behave the way guys like that had to behave, where they no longer had the desire, the want, the urgency to be that guy because they got the things that they, they needed to get to, to get, a, you know, to be comfortable as you used the word earlier, when they get to that place, they had a problem because they, were, they lost their nerve. He broke it down in simple ways. They lost their nerve. They lost their, their, uh, the, the savageness, obviously, um, but they lost the ability to behave like a gangster. <laughs> and... You could look at that in any, I know that's a rough way to look at it. People are going to say, Teddy, you used a pretty rough, uh, you know, thing to talk about. But that was the thing back then for Cus to talk about. And he was, he was just translating it, paralleling it to anything. And, it's, and to, a, to a business that was dangerous. When you're no longer, when you were now, you got comfortable and you didn't want to be in danger anymore, then you were in the wrong business. 
You, and I yeah. think that goes for your business. 100%. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's a great, that's a great story or, or comparison to, to, to fighting. I know, like you said, we're not glorifying gangsters, but the mindset to do the things that these guys do. Uh, you have to be ready to, to be. die. Look, when you're no longer, when you're no longer that, that dirty face kid, <laughs> you know, they, they used to have the Bowery Boys and all those guys, right? Uh, you know, Angels with Dirty Faces, all those movies, right? Uh, when you're no longer that guy, where you're willing to go out there and freaking, you know, uh, get, get shot to, to do what you have to do, if that's what you have to do, to, to die, to suffer. When you're no longer ready to mm -hmm. do that, you don't have that mentality to do that, you're done. Yeah. And um, I want to just dive into what's been going on. You just gave us an honest answer. You, you don't know what you're doing yet. You don't know who you're fighting next. You're just going to get ahead of the game a little bit, right? Ahead of the curve. You're down yeah. in Florida. You get stuck in your body ready, and we'll see what pops up. Um, you've been watching fights. There's been some good fights. And I couldn't help but think in the recent, one of the recent fights, Oliveira and... and, um, and uh, and, Justin, and Gaethje. Get Justin Gaethje. In that fight, when, I mean, it was an interesting fight. And matter of fact, before I even talk about that fight, I want to talk about the fight that was on the card, Chandler and Ferguson. Now, in that fight, I found it interesting that after Chandler had a nice win, a dramatic win, a lot of you guys' uh, fights are dramatic. My God, that's why the UFC's yeah. brand is where it is, quite frankly. And it surpassed boxing as far as uh, audience when it comes to regular week-to-week -week fights, unless you put on Canelo or somebody. So, in that fight with Chandler, he got the right to talk. He, 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 he did a magnificent job. He got the win. He struggled early. He got the win. And then... He called out everybody, and I thought it was a little... Tell me if you were thinking the same thing. I know you're an honest guy. Uh, it, it was a little suspicious, whatever, but it was just interesting that he called all these names out, good names, but your name wasn't one of them. Did you find that a little interesting or <laughs> curious or suspicious or whatever the hell? I, th I thought it was. I thought it was. I, the next day I tweeted out, that that exact thing i said he's called out everybody but i didn't hear my name um i'm, I'm a i'm a dangerous fight for him i think I, i'm a clean puncher accurate uh i think connor he called out connor i think connor's a dangerous fight for him too um you know i'm not saying chandler's chinny or anything but he gets hurt in a lot of his fights and and guys like connor you know they can punch if you if you're getting hurt by tony ferguson um and dropped by uh Oliveira, Guys like me, guys like Connor, if we touch your chin, it's going to be bad, you know? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I, I think part of the reason he does, and that's part of the reason why I think people have taken to him so quickly after coming, you know, coming from, uh, uh, what, what's the name of the one? Bellator. Yeah, Bellator. You know, I think uh, he's built a pretty good, well, he had an audience already and he had a fan base, but he's built that even more because he does take risks and he is vulnerable, you know, in those ways. And he is all out. <laughs> he, he's, that's, and that's, that's the reason why he gets, yeah, he gets yeah, hurt exactly. Because he's, you, you can't, you can't have an offense and a defense and he's all offense jumping forward, lunging forward. And, uh, you know what they say when you, when you, your feet leave the ground in boxing, you get carried out, jumping around, throwing punches in the air. You can't pivot. You can't move. You run into big shots, you know. You jump in, you get carried the out. The other thing I want to ask you, the Oliveira Gagey fight. All right. Were you what the first fight was before they got in the octagon, it was the weight. And he didn't oh, yeah, make yeah. the weight. Tell me what you thought, because I'm really curious to see what a fighter thinks when a guy in that kind of a spot doesn't make weight by half a pound. I mean, I can't argue with the commission. Uh, apparently, he did miss weight. But for me, I think um, these these uh, 
we need to be on digital scale. So there's no gray area, right? You can't have a guy there tapping a, a, a weight balance scale and it's kind of balancing and he just says it's a half pound or whatever. You know, we, we need exact numbers. Get on a digital scale. It shows up on the screen. That's your actual weight. You know, I don't like the fact that these guys are tapping this uh, balance scale, you know. 100%. I agree. Now, were you surprised, shocked when he got within a half a pound and he couldn't make it? He couldn't take it off. I thought I was I was shocked. I was shocked on the second. I was, you know, kind of surprised when he came in a little bit over. But maybe they they misjudged some things or the scale was different back in the in the locker room, whatever. I don't know. I thought that in that hour time he would come back and, and be on weight, especially a championship fight. You know, I thought he was gonna Did lose. Did he try to pounds. lose it? Let me ask you a question. Because we like to go deep here. Did he and nobody else is gonna bring this out, I don't think, and no one else is gonna be this honest about it as you would. But and 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 really educational to the audience. Um to be able to show them these things. Do you think he tried to make it? Have you? And part of that question is, uh, have you ever been to a point where you could not lose another few ounces without being done? In other words, stone dry. I've never completely stopped losing weight, but I've been in a position where I was in the sauna for, you know, very long time and just my body was burned out and I just couldn't get it in, to, in me to, to break another sweat, to go for another jog, to put these sweats back on. I've been close. You know, I've been to the point um, when I fought Eddie Alvarez in Canada in, in Quebec, I was laying in the locker room. I was doing the, I was like, all right, if I'm this way, this, I was doing the percentages. I was subtracting 20% from my fight purse to see what I was going to, I was like, oh, what am I giving away here? Cause I really thought I was going to miss it. But uh, we ended up going to a different, different place. And uh, have I you wait. been at a place where, You've just what you're describing, and then you just said, I I'm not going to lose it, even though you know, obviously, you're going to have to pay the penalty. Uh, it's, I, if I lose it, it's gonna, it's gonna be detrimental to my chances in the octagon. I never have, no, I've, I've always, I've always pushed. Do you the think extra it's possible that's what happened with, uh, you know, with, with him, where he got to a place, Oliveira got to a place where he said, you know what, I, I can't lose another freaking half a pound ounces um it's gonna hurt me it didn't seem that way teddy because they weren't carrying him out he wasn't stumbling around he didn't look like you know he's always really lean and and, and he's long and tall so he looks slim but he's a big guy but he, he didn't look like he needed to be helped you know he was still had life in his body he he could have it looked like try to lose more weight yeah I mean, you were shocked though that he didn't right i mean yeah yeah for sure it's a championship fight you know um now he goes out there, wins the fight, but it doesn't count as a title defense. You know, uh, it goes, it's just, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. Good, Ken. Chill outlined on his show that, it, that he said you could ar make an argument and he went through a bunch of mathematic gymnastics to say this bra might have cost him $2 million not to lose the half a pound. So I got to believe he tried to lose it. But when he has that, you know, there was a knock on him early in his career that he had quit in a fight or two. And I almost wonder if if the weight cut was a similar mindset. And unfortunately for him, that kind of knock follows him around. I haven't seen any quitting him in any time in the recent history. But I just wonder if that was part of the mindset. You have any thoughts on that? You know, I have seen him stop or, or not continue in fights where, where I think he could have continued. Uh, like you said, the knock he has on him. But he's proven everybody wrong about that in his last three fights. You know, he's touched the canvas in his last three fights and ended up winning three, you know, world championship fights in a row. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm labeling the last one as a, as a title fight. Three championship fights. That was the title defense to me. Yeah, right? I agree. Shifting gears for a minute back to Chandler. Um, I think we're going to have him on the show in the next week or two. And, and the one thing that I always um, struggle with emotionally is when guys who I consider to be really good guys fight each other. It's like, ugh hard to root against either guy per se and i i view chandler as like a nice guy he's a quality guy he's we have obviously in common that we both have adopted children and he lives here in nashville so i'm torn obviously we go we we, we we'll ride or die with uh on dustin poirier but um that's a tough one because he's a good guy do you have does that enter the equation for you like does that affect your preparation at all when you like versus like a connor who you clearly don't like for preparing for a Chandler where there's not probably going to be much trash talk, at least not the kind of aggressive trash talk you get with Connor. How does that enter into the equation as you prepare for the pre-fight, like Teddy would say, the first fight, the the prep, the press conference, the weigh in, the stare down versus a fight with someone like Connor? I don't, for me, nothing changes really with the prep. 
but it's a little bit easier for me to like uh, mentally. There's, there's not as much, uh, you know, like I said, fighting is stressful, dude. And, and if the guy's chirping the whole time, the whole eight weeks and, and saying stuff about you and talking trash, it's just like, it's aggravating. It just adds more to it, but I don't think it affects the way I train or, or do anything. I'm still going to get my reps in. I'm still going to push myself, um, whether the guy's a nice guy or, or a bad guy. I'm going to try to lump <laughs> him you up. You might have just answered it, but I'm going to ask the question anyway um, so we can get a direct, definitive answer. Um, at this point in your career, Dustin, what is harder to prepare, preparing for the physical part, which is hard, the physical part of a fight and everything that that you know, involves, or the mental part of getting ready for a fight? It's a tough question. I, the, uh, the mental part takes more. The, the physical part is just like I've been working, like I've been training and, and getting in shape and cutting weight and doing this stuff for years now. So that's, you know, it's still tough. It's hard to, to beat your body up and sweat every day, but that's nothing uh, compared to the mental side. I feel like um, the, the mental prep takes a lot more out of my, I have to go out of my way to do it. The physical prep, I'm doing that because I, that's what I do. The mental prep, I have to like sit down at the table, write things down, read. I have to make time for myself before I go to, go to bed at night. Uh, things that I do, I have to go out of my way and, and, and do things like that to, to prepare. You know, I like to write, I like to write things down. I have a, notebooks all over here with, with just things that thoughts that come about, uh, throughout the day or things that I want to happen this week with training, um, things that I can control. I, I might've told you this before I, I draw a circle and everything I can control, I write inside the circle for training camp and everything I can, I write outside the circle. And I kind of just go back to that, refresh, look at it. Maybe I'll add a couple of things inside the circle as the weeks go on. Maybe I'll add a couple of things outside the circle. And I just go back to that and kind of keeps me grounded, but I have to go out of my way to do those things. Going to the gym is, is you know, I've been doing that forever. This this mental side of stuff is kind of newer. When I ask these questions, part of me, I, you can't get away from being what you are. You're you're a fighter. You're 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 a gentleman, a family man, everything. And but you're a savage inside the octagon. That's what you're trained to be. You're a fi and smart. Because uh, the smart savages always beat the... Uh, I always used to say to my fighters, be a smart monster. <laughs> That's yeah, what yeah. I always say. Well, I want a monster, but I want a smart monster, you know? And, um, you know, and all, all, of, all of that is, is obviously uh, what, what you produce yourself to be. Um, but... At the at the end of the, I I want to go, I I want to touch on the the fight with Gagey that we were just talking about, Gagey and Oliveira, where for me it was very similar to your fight with Oliveira. There was a lot of similarities, and you and Gagey there's a lot of similarities. I would I would say anyway, um, as fighters, um. And, and a lot that fans like because of the way you guys fight and the way, the way you strike, the way you do all of your business um, and the way you approach it. But the similarities were pretty obvious. Uh, Gagey hurts Oliveira, drops him twice. You hurt Oliveira, and you drop him early. Uh, Gagey, I couldn't help but think of you when I was watching a fight because when Gagey dropped him, Normally, your instinct and inclination would be to get on him, you know, to try to finish him. But when you got a guy like Oliveira, who who's so damn good on a mat at, with the jujitsu and obviously with all that, I mean, it's it's like jumping on a python snake. You know, not too many people want to jump on a python snake because it'll wrap itself around you before you know it, and you think that you could use your physicality, and before you know it, you can't, because you missed it, and it's around you, it's wrapped around your neck, your torso, and everything else. And I saw that hesitation in Gagey, where I'm sure 9 out of 10, he would have went on the guy, but he didn't. I saw that with you too, in your fight, where... 
normally I think you would have probably looked to finish him by obviously getting close to him. And the, you hesitated for a good reason because of his expertise down on the mat. Um, two parts to this question. Do you think he made a mistake? And did you kind of see yourself, did you retrace your own fight watching that where you wondered about what your move should have been there? Do you, do you think he made a mistake first? I do. I think he should have followed him up, um, got on top, tried to finish the fight, you know, find out how hurt Charles really was. There's only one way to find out. You got to dive in. Same thing with me. You know, I, I shouldn't have. Of course, you have to respect the jiu-jitsu. I've been doing jiu-jitsu forever. I'm a black belt as well. Um, compete with and train with the best guys in the world. Um, and I'm confident I have good jiu-jitsu, you know, and uh, I just respected his too much that I didn't engage. You know, the, the plan was to by any means stay out of the, off the ground and, and don't play jiu-jitsu at all with this guy. So even in the second round, when I ended up on my back and he was in, on top, I just tried to get stood up. I tried to get a stalemate. I, I didn't engage and use my jiu-jitsu offensively or defensively. And I should have, you know, I c should have created space. I should have attempted submissions and used that to, to, to create space and get back up. And, uh, but those are the, those are the, the answers we get from the fights like we were talking about, you know. I, you I, fought him again. If you fought him again, I mean, obviously we're, we're not looking to give away anything, but... Um, I would do everything I did the exact same way, except when I was on the ground, I would have used my jiu-jitsu offensively. You would have trusted it instead of trusting his more. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that's 100% accurate. Hey guys, want to take a quick pause to give a thank you to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens, the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. Love this stuff. Take it every day. I credit Athletic Greens with keeping me healthy through multiple marathon training cycles. Um, you know, as some of you know, I've run faster every year for the last 15 years from 35 to 51. I've still got work to do this year to get a faster time in 2022. And I've got the Berlin Marathon and Chicago Marathon coming up in the fall. So you can bet your behind that I won't be missing a day of Athletic Greens. It's an insurance policy for my health and health and immunity system, especially with all the work travel that I do. It's important that you get all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients that Athletic Greens provides, especially when you live in a hectic lifestyle. You're working a lot, you're training, you've got a lot of commitments whether you do or you don't it's just emphasized when you do have all those commitments that you get all the nutrients that you need go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase i love these travel packs to me they're invaluable athleticgreens.com slash atlas 10 free travel packs with your first purchase also like to give a shout out to one of my favorite running apparel brands, Wallaco, Way of Athletic, Way of Life Athletic Clothing Company, based in New York, founded by the great Terry White, Lacrosse Extraordinaire. This is a brand built by athletes for athletes. It really is good stuff. Their kind of patented signature move is they've got a waterproof pocket that fits your phone perfectly because let's face it, no one's going anywhere without their phones these days. So I love these shorts. I wear them in the summer. I wear them in the winter under tights. I have these Wallaco shorts on constantly. Go to wallaco.com. Use the promo code ATLAS and they'll give you 20% off whatever you like. Sweatpants, t-shirts, they've got it all. Love these guys. Terry White at Wallaco, doing it right. Wallaco.com, use the promo code ATLAS. Also like to give a quick shout out to Botanic Tonics. You guys know this stuff, Feel Free it's called. It's a, um, I guess you could describe it as a euphoric botanical tonic based on the kava leaf. And um, listen, I take this stuff before my big workouts. I take it before races, whenever I need to pick me up. It's advertised as creating a euphoric feeling. I think it gives me a quick boost of energy, but I've also taken it when I've sat down to watch sports and uh, it just makes me feel good. So check them out at Botanic Tonics. Uh, I believe it's BotanicTonics.com, but go to the show notes. They'll give you 40% off your purchase using the promo code ATLAS. A-T-L-A-S for 40% off your feel-free purchase, Botanic Tonics. 
And you know what? I I lost myself a moment ago. I like to be honest. You know, <laughs> like I always talk about being honest or uh, whatever. Uh, sometimes it's less convenient than others. But when I started talking about we are what we are, and I went down that road a little bit, then I jumped to this. What I was going to use <laughs> to jump to this was you are what you are, and with I'm what I am. At the core, I'm a I'm a trainer. I'm a teacher. And I, I can't help but want the audience to learn something. And that's, that's kind of what is connected to a lot of my questions. I want people to get better. I want people to learn something. And that's why I knew I was going to go down that road and ask that question. You know, that, that you can only ask with an honest guy. Because a lot of guys let their ego get in the way. Cuss used to tell me, don't let your ego get in the way. And, and it gets in a way in funny ways, but it protects you in funny ways where all of a sudden you say, no, I don't want to admit that I, I should have went on the floor with him because that's, that's admitting that I did something wrong. But by admitting it, you could do something right. And I, I just, that's why I went that direction. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit where I, where I make mistakes, man. I, that's, that's part of life. And uh, I'm pretty honest with myself. And I try not to make... You know, try not to make mistakes, but but of course we all do. I think of, I'd love to see you find him again. I don't know. That's uh, and and if you had the choice, Ken touched on it a little bit earlier, Dustin. If you had the choice between any fight you could get, a fourth fight with McGregor, you know, we understand what goes with that, right? You know, uh, besides the you know the fight, but everything else that goes with it, the money, the the the, the largeness of it. Or another shot at the title with Oliveira, which of course everything goes with that too. Um, what would you take? I would take the title uh, fight for sure. That's kind of what I expect you to say. I mean, that's the one thing that is still there for you to get, right? I mean, that's still. I still, I still want it. I still want it. Um, Ken asked the same question earlier: Would, would I go to one seventy and take a big money fight, or would I fight for the one fifty five belt? Um, if it's at 170, I, w- I would take a money fight because the, f- the 55 is still there. But if it's at 155, I'm not going to do the Conor fight. I want I want to fight for the belt. I, one thing, I would love to see the fight, and you touched on a little bit earlier. I'd love to see any of those fights. And I want to see the fight that's best for Dustin Poirier. But I would love to see you and Chandler. There's, there's a certain intrigue about that because you both sell out. You know, to a certain, I think you're a little, well, I sell out in a good way. I don't mean sell out in a bad way. Sell out where you're in that ring and you're both willing to take those chances. You're willing to go for it. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're willing to, you know, walk that, that tightrope to get there um, and, and to go right into the lion's cage if, if that's what it takes. But uh, I think you're a little bit, your experience would give you a little edge in that area uh, of knowing when to go for it and also knowing when to be a little responsible in certain other areas. He He's a seek and destroy missile. And, uh, and, and, and listen, that's why I'd love to see you and him, <laughs> you and him fight. No, it'd be a great, it'd be a great fight. Whenever they matched him up with the, uh, when Chandler and Gaethje got matched up and I saw the fight announced, I knew right away, you know, that's just one of those fights that, gets the fans excited i think the same thing for me and chandler if, if our fight if our fight would get announced you'd, it'd be that same kind of vibe you know because people know what they're 100%. gonna get i mean that fight became fight of the year correct i, I believe it was yeah that yeah, was a great was fight at the great garden fight. it was uh it was go ahead ken I was going to say, I think part of the challenge now is a fight at a fight at 170 is the big money fight, but I don't see them giving you the next title shot at 155. So it will most likely be uh, an eliminator at 155, correct? Yeah. So they offered me um, an eliminator at the end of the year in October, but I don't want to wait that long to fight. Yep. You know? When you think of... Um, I don't want to wait that long to fight. When you think of uh, the Nate Diaz fight, how, uh, on a scale of one to ten, where does that rank? Ten being like I, I want him desperately. What, what do you think? 
I'm not desperate for any of these gotcha. guys, but I definitely I want to fight. You know, I want. I mean, fight, desperate in a good way, Nate. where you feel like that's a big fight that I know I can win, and it's going to draw. That's I, I, I know you never. That's, a, that's another one of those matchups that's going to draw. It's a fun fight. It's a guy I've been watching forever. You know, forever. the other thing is I think they got Nate uh, in a tough position. Yeah, man, his yeah. I think they got well, Nick. I mean, unfortunately, did not look good in his last fight. There's nothing that he showed in that last fight to indicate that anyone wants to see him again. He, he just didn't even look like he was trying, to be honest. And I love and I, I love the man, Diaz brothers. I'm such a big yeah, fan. such a big fan to see legends go out there and and not do themselves, you know the right way like that. I just I hate to see it, but that's fighting. Yeah, that's why dude. I mean that's the same as in my sport. Where you just um, you get really depressed seeing Joe Lewis when he's no longer Joe Lewis, you know, in the ring, or Muhammad Ali when he's not Muhammad Ali anymore, you right. know, going too right. long, going too late. Um, it, but it happens to a lot of fighters. Well, when it does happen, because let me they're ask fighters, you, they don't know when yeah, to stop. They yeah, can't stop. They you, won't yeah. stop. They're fighters. That's what I was just going to ask you, uh, Dustin. The fans would love to hear it from you why is, is it, and let me touch the things that some fans might think, because they have to make money, which unfortunately does become part of it sometimes. But what do you, and, and it shouldn't be, but it is sometimes, because they usually made a lot of money. Uh, but what do you think it is? Just that they're fighters and you can't turn it off? They have to fight to have existence, to be relative, to have an identity, to be alive? They have to fight? I, I don't I, I think so. I think it's, they've done it for so long and it's become, it's not just something they do anymore. It's who they are. It's not just, they're not, that's who they are. Um, and I feel it in myself a little bit like that. Cause like in these past five weeks or five months since my fight up, trying to tell myself, ah, another fight's going to come along, but I just, you know, just take my time, be patient. But I feel like I need to be in the middle of the storm, you know, that I need to be in it. That, and, and maybe that's what they're going through when you get to that age, when you, the fight is the last one to know when to stop. Everybody around him knows knows first, yeah, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it touches on what we're both talking about. The core of it is, you almost stop existing as a, as the person that you have to be when you stop being a fighter. That that you're no longer you're no longer that. You're no longer relative. You're no yeah. longer. It's so attached to what you are, and what you feel, and have to feel every day of your life as the person you are. That when that's eliminated, it's almost like you're dead. Right. I think that's where you need like the right management around you, right? People looking out for you. You do. You do. Does that help though? Does that who- help? Because at the end of the day, you answered yourself. Does that help? Because at the end of the day, nobody's going to tell you. That it's it's you need to stop. I don't I don't think unless maybe it's your wife. But go ahead. No, I think it's you can have all the people around you. It's a, it's an internal thing. It's whatever it is that, that makes us keep fighting or makes these guys fight longer than they should. It's an internal thing. I don't think anything uh, externally can change that. It's it's what's going on between their ears. You know, they're just so intertwined with fighting. It's it's what they do. It's who they are. It's what I am. You know, I I don't I don't want it to stop. Even on the days that I hate it. At the, you know, at the end of the night, at the end of the day, I, I love this. You know, it's a relationship. It's a give and take. I love it so much. I hate it. It, it. It's crazy, man, what goes on in between your ears as a fighter. And doing it this long, you know, um, yeah, I, I can't. I don't know what's going to happen when it stops. And I don't want it to, honestly. Does a commission have a responsibility, Dustin? You know, to, does a commission have a responsibility. You know, they're making money in the sport with the fighters. They're making money because of you guys. Otherwise, there'd be no jobs for them. There'd be no commission. Let's be honest. Does a commission, a New York Athletic Commission, or the Las Vegas Commission, whatever the commissions are for boxing, for UFC, uh, for MMA, do they have a responsibility at some point to say, this guy, from what we've seen, shouldn't be in the ring anymore yeah i i think there should be uh, a governing body a sanction whatever to, to have the power to say no no more you know to, to say no more because i mean you know I, i've been to fights boxing matches where i've, I've 
a guy have, you know, they're building up a fighter and they put him across, across the ring from a guy who shouldn't be in there and has more losses than they have wins. And you just don't want to see this guy go down, you know, cause one of these nights he goes down, he's going to leave something that he can't get back. And it, it, I, I've seen it before, you know, I've seen it before where I, I know this guy should not be in there. And I think the commission should step in. Let me go to a, a lighter subject. Uh, How's your charity doing with uh, the the good fight? You do so much good work. How's it doing? Thank you. Uh, doing great. Doing great. We just um, we always have so much stuff going on with it. We're we're always active in our community in Louisiana. But we just uh, did pack and plays and car seats for for a women's and children's hospital in Lafayette, Louisiana. This is the second time we've done that with them. And uh, September we partnered up to sponsor St. Jude's 5K in Lafayette, Louisiana. And so in September, if anybody's around Louisiana, yeah, I think you can do it virtually too. Go to the goodfightgroup.com. I have a link there. You can run it virtually from whatever state you're in, but we're raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And um, we got the back, back to school stuff starting to get prepped up with that, placing orders for backpacks and things like that. We're going to be doing uh, a thousand backpacks filled with school supplies again. And this year we're going to do not only for the kids, but a lot of people don't know these teachers, man, um, they're coming out of their own pocket and buying stuff for these, for these, for the kids in their classrooms, things that they need. Um, I, I, that's crazy to me that teachers have to dip into their own money to, to supply children with things uh, in the classroom. So what we're going to do is start a teacher's fund and help the teachers in, in Louisiana get what they need for the classroom. So they don't have to come out of their pocket. Beautiful. You know, I agree with you hundred percent. I, I, I'll piggyback off that. You know, a lot of people don't realize coaches in this business, your business, my business, um, you know, when they're starting out with these amateur kids especially, and they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to reach their dreams uh, for the kid, for themselves, and they're taking them to these tournaments and, you know, doing all the back alley work that nobody really understands or sees. They see the guy when he, when he gets to the big fight at Caesar's Palace, you know, but they forget about what went into it for, for all those years sometimes. And a lot of those coaches go out of their pockets. A lot of, a lot of, I'm sure you witness it. I witness it in my business. I lived it in my business, so I, I sure as hell know what it is. But um, you, you got a kid when he's 15 years old, 14 years old, whatever, and, and you bring them along, uh, trying to give them a chance to reach that goal. Uh, there's nobody. I don't think people realize that nobody's subsidizing. You are. <laughs> the coaches, regular people that are working a job or two jobs, and then on their time off, they're going to the gym with the kid, taking them on trips, and they're, they're going into their own wallet to do it. Yeah. I think those guys should it's be passion, important. man. I don't know. For I, sure. I really do. For sure. Dustin, I wonder if um, at that 5K, maybe we could do a, a collab with the fight uh, and the good fight, and maybe I'll donate – a certain amount of money for every person that can beat me in that race. Maybe I'll give five hundred or thousand bucks to for for however many. Can beat so you. Two, three people. I knew Kevin was going to get in there. I knew he was going to get in You won't be do you won't be do you won't be donating anything. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's doing it. That's why he's doing yeah. it. How yeah. no, many guys maybe, in that race yeah. can run a marathon in two hours and thirty <laughs> minutes? Please stop. So, you know what I mean? Come on. Maybe we'll that, that's why he's donating it because we'll nobody's commit. winning. Commit to a minim minimum of two grand, but maybe an extra five hundred or a thousand for every person that can beat me. See if we can't get some big name runners to come down here and kick my ass, and uh, see if we can't get a good crew of uh, runners when they see who's coming to compete. We'll figure something out. That would be fun. That would be that's a great idea. That'd be Ken fun. right out the. He's getting bigger and bigger by the moment. He's a promotional genius. Um, <laughs> uh, I just hope he lets me. Uh, auction off his Rolodex that's grown so much uh, uh, at my charity foundation coming up in uh, November. I hope to God he could do that because the the bid, the opening bid would have to be about a hundred thousand. I mean, I, I mean that's that's how large this guy has gotten. Uh, but I right. mean that's like him saying for anyone who could be that's <laughs> I have to that's I'm great. Open, I'm open no, to no, suggestions. No, 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 yeah, I just want to get some people out there. It's tantamount to. Uh, um, pick a guy, Crawford, Crawford walking into a place, or, or Canelo, and, and saying, okay, 
anybody here right now <laughs> that's that's uh, you know in this diner here having cheeseburgers anybody <laughs> here that could beat me in the ring i am going to buy you your next meal for another 10 years yeah okay <laughs> sure Sure. No, we're gonna we're gonna work on it together and see if we can't get a bunch of people down there. Maybe we'll come up with a handicapping system where uh, you know if you're within five. I'm not that for my five k pace is the same as my marathon pace. I don't have like real quickness like some of these young guys. You might get some high school kids that are gonna kill me. But maybe we can get some extra people down there to come if they think they get a shot at uh, winning at a Ken. couple bucks. I can a shot at Ken. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> and then do me a favor. If he's going to do this, please, at least put him, Dustin, in one of those boots with the water underneath them, you know, with a, the a clown's face. <laughs> and, and we're, please, at least after the race, he's got to cool off anyway, right? So at least put right. him in that and then pick up a few. Dunk, a yeah. few. And listen, speaking of food, <laughs> speaking of food and, and all the things we're just touching on over here, um, How's your, how how's the sales going in that Louisiana hot sauce of uh, Dustin Poirier? How's that doing? Great, man. Great. Uh, things are rocking on the uh, retail side. We got into Costco in in Canada, a bunch of locations out in Canada. So now nah, we're I, got, I actually got a bottle right here. I just ate oh, lunch. That's <laughs> nice. No, that's great. That's yeah, yeah. smart. That's great. It's good stuff. I never got mine. Somebody. Uh, commandeered it. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I think you sent it. Send me the address. We'll get you. We'll get you hooked up. I sent a box. Yeah. Out today. All right. Thank you. Because the last time you sent it to Ken, and I don't know. Somehow I, I don't know. Somehow it, I didn't get it. I'm not. I'm, I don't. Know. I definitely <laughs> dropped the ball. Um. But no. Good luck with that. Congratulations with everything. Uh. I just. Uh, I just want to thank you for. For Thank being you, who you are. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, and, and for fighting we... and for fighting for for other people. I think that's that's a great gift and a great privilege. If we can fight for more than ourselves and fight for other people that can't fight for themselves, and you do that, so thank you. I appreciate it, man. I, I don't t I don't take it lightly. I I, I honor it. No, I know sure. you do, and I appreciate you for that. One of the things I want to talk about before we let you go is, um, you know. In addition to being an unbelievable fighter, former champion, et cetera, et cetera, I think from a marketing standpoint, you're one of the most marketable guys. If there's brands out there that are looking for um, looking for connectivity to the combat sports uh, fan base, I couldn't think of a better ambassador for a brand. So before we let you go, I just want to make sure that the brands that you are working with get the recognition that they deserve. Talk about some of the sponsors. I know you've added some new ones. And like I said, anyone, any brand out there looking to get involved in combat sports and get some exposure, this is your guy. So tell us about the brands you're working with now. Um, Celsius Energy Drinks. They've been, they've been having my back for a while. I appreciate them. Great group of people. Great team. Um, they're actually out here in Boca Raton, so not too far from the gym. I stop in on them every now and then. Uh, Samsung, Samsung, uh, Android gang, man. People always bust my balls about it, walking around <laughs> with a Samsung, but I was doing it for years and years before I ever got a sponsorship with Samsung, but we're going strong, man. Yeah, Celsius, Samsung, Robert Graham, Hopwater, my whole team. I just want to thank everybody. Yeah, man. Hop, hop water is the uh, is the water infused with hops, like a, like almost like a beer, but non alcoholic, right? Yeah, it's a self, it's a seltzer water. It has like it's it's brewed with hops. It's got a hint of like an IPA kind of finish on it, but it's not strong at all. Um, there's no alcohol, and there's some nootropics in there as well, but zero calorie. It's not not sweet. It's just a nice refreshing. Um, Spritzer, yeah, you know? and everyone loves those uh, Robert Graham, uh, Dustin Poirier shirts. Not going to miss you in a crowd in that shirt. Dude, I, I went to a UFC wearing an orange and red <laughs> one. I saw somebody comment. They said, looks like a, you, dude, looks like a fat parrot because I had this big <laughs> red and orange shirt. <laughs> oh, good for you. Man. Uh, internet's undefeated, but but uh, Robert Graham, man, keep me colorful always. That's true. It does. Uh, before you go, I thought of one other thing because I, you know, talk about respecting your sports and as i said i respect you for fighting for other people and trying to make things better uh, we're, we're, i'm always thinking even though sometimes it's uh wishful thinking unfortunately but i'm always thinking how can i make my sport a little bit better 
and, and part of it is what we do on this show, me and Ken do. I, I really take it to heart in a serious way where I, I try to bring out things that I think are wrong. Not that I'm the knight on a, on a white horse or anything like that. I'm far from that. Um, but I have a platform, and I figured I could use it for more than just, you know, uh, making a living or, or trying to obviously be uh, successful. But I could also maybe educate a little bit and, and maybe help the sport in bringing out things that really, I believe, hurt the sport and has hurt the sport for a long time. And part of that is bad judging. I, it, it hurt, it's been around for a long time uh, where... I fought a fought on ESPN when I had my platform there to the point where you know I got I got um I got my hands whacked with a with a ruler a couple of times yeah. so to speak but um with a ruler I think they tried to cut your head off a couple of times yeah yeah <laughs> but it, <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay that. but I I just feel that if we can we try to make things better a little bit and the fight is for everything as Dustin touched on earlier, you go in the ring, sometimes you you leave the ring with a part of yourself that's not there anymore. And because of that, I think that fighters need to be looked out, need to be protected in those ways. And if you're robbing them in fights with just unjust decisions, whether corrupt or incompetence, one or the other, it hurts the fighter tremendously because they don't get to where they want to get to and where they deserve to get to. And in my business, they got to go back on the back of the line, take thousands of punches or the risk of thousands of punches to get there. They might never get there again and to make money for their family uh, at that level. So it really does bother me. And I go after these guys to, to try to, again, to improve the state of judging. What did you feel as a fighter when you watched? I'm, gonna, I'm kind of taken for granted that you watched the Bevo Canelo fight. And um, what did you think about those scores when you're, when you're, I mean, thankfully the right guy won the fight or got the fight. What they, what they have been winning by? Two point. Four two, or five no, rounds? Two, two. No, two, <laughs> two. Four or five. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. come on, man. Yeah. I, I, like you said, at least the right guy won. Yeah. Um, but I'm a, I'm a fan of both guys. But in, in, in mixed martial arts, the judging has been crazy, you know, like this, just last weekend, Holly Holm uh, fight. I heard that was a bad you know, a decision. I didn't see it, but I heard it was horrible. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a, there's been a lot of them, man, in, in mixed martial arts. Um, I'm trying to think of like any boxing one. What's the like biggest robbery in boxing recently? Oh, it was, I think it was almost the Bevo Canelo. The only <laughs> trouble was a, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a cop showed up as they were loading up the truck, and and they yeah. they dropped the they dropped the bags of money before they could get out. But um, no, I, I, there's been so many. <laughs> I hate to say it that way. There's so many that yeah. nobody really sticks out because I mean, it's one like that a jumps regular out at occurrence. Me. The one that I, I don't remember. I didn't. I, I didn't know the Canelo fight was that close. Oh I didn't, my, I didn't yeah, know the, um, well, the scores were that close. No, because you saw what you saw, and they shouldn't have been that yeah, damn yeah. close. But um, it's right. such a regular occurrence with bad fights, uh, bad I mean, horrible decisions that sometimes, sometimes you forget. But Ken, you you what was the the one that sticks out the most to me is the first Canelo and Triple G fight. Triple G won that fight. Okay, they gave yeah. him a draw, yeah. and I was like, "Come on, man! That wasn't a draw. That was, that was one way, one way fight there." Yeah, that was a big. I one. mean, recently there's but but the problem is, unless it's a huge name, nobody really you know turns an eye. Well, it's Josh like they, Taylor. Josh yeah. Taylor got the benefit of uh, favorable judging recently. You could easily make the case he lost his last fight. Yeah, of course. But again, not a big name. His opponent wasn't a name that was that was highly, you know, highly thought of or new, you know, didn't have a big uh, resume or, or people didn't really know who he was to that extent. So nobody says anything. Uh, they they don't like I said they don't lift an eyebrow. It, it doesn't really it doesn't even hit the radar screen of of annoying people because it's not a big name. 
Uh, but there was yeah. a few others. I'm trying to remember the other ones. That, that was, was one. Catterall. That that was Catterall in there with uh, with Josh Taylor, Jack Catterall. Yeah, that was Catterall. Um, that's, and to your that's point, right. Teddy, like you always say, is the sad thing is that might have been the fight of Catterall's career. Now he has to go back do it again. When everyone saw what happened the first time, now people are going to be watching closer with the judging. But it's such a kick in the mm-hmm. ass to have to go back to the drawing board and be like, that was everything I had. I, I, you know, everything was clicking. He wasn't on his best game. I was, and now he's got to go back. And, you know, Josh Taylor's a killer. He might come back with a renewed sense of, you know, determination and focus and put it on him this time. And they, they robbed him of that I chance. I don't know if judges, I don't know if judges realize that. Like, they need to go in there. And when they sit at that table and, and they turn those scores in between each round or however they, you do it, they, they're potentially affecting someone's livelihood here. You know, somebody's career, the years and years of blood, sweat, and tears for you not to pay attention or to be looking away or, or you know, making up scores at the end of a round is, is criminal, you know? Or giving scores so that you get invited to the next big fight in Vegas and get the four it's seasons res- uh, suite and all the, like, amenities that go with judging a big fight. It's like all, like, unwritten, you know, kind of under-the-radar stuff. Sweets for your friends, who yeah. knows? But the point is, you don't give the promoter the decision that they want on the close rounds. You can bet your ass you won't be at the next one. When I had my seat at ESPN for all those years, I I would say we need to judge the judges. 100%. Really? Yeah. We judge the fighter's performance. We need to judge the judge's performance. Are, are, yeah. are they giving consistently bad performances look if, if you drive bad your freaking driver's license gets taken away right <laughs> really uh, you yeah. get too many you know too many uh, violations or accidents or whatever the you know whatever but if you have too many bad decisions that are ridiculous and people can understand it uh in fights well get your license taken away a license should be earned uh, you know, really. And there should be some kind of classes or some kind of yearly thing that these, these men and women have to go through to keep their license valid. You know, the, it, it's and crazy. And the pool should be deeper. It shouldn't be the same three guys in Vegas, the same three guys in New York. Add some guys to the pool. Maybe add another one or two judges to each fight. Make it hard to control the narrative and control the scoring. I mean, everyone wants that. I always think the, the best judges would be former fighters. Yep, you know. exactly. There's only one problem with that. Um, I think that you're on to what you're on to, and it's they should have some background in the sport, a hundred percent. And as as fighters, um, in the sport, but then comes the element that if they and Cus used to bring this up, if they pref- if they fought a certain kind of style, and and they didn't like another style because maybe they got beat by that style. You know, that style might have been, uh, you know, a nemesis to them, you know, whatever. Maybe a real flashy, fast guy that loved to box on the outside, move around a lot, and, and never liked the guys that, you know, are coming forward all the time, uh, banging away. That can prejudice their, For their sure. decisions when they got that pencil in their hand. So, and, yeah. and so you gotta be, you gotta be a little cognizant of that too. Um, it's gotta be obviously fighters that are, go through a test to get the license and part of that test should bring out these things, should search out these things to see if they're capable of understanding how to judge on the full criterion of what the, what the judging should be based on you know stop being so subjective you know where the, well i like this guy because he boxed the way i used to box or he boxed the way my hero used to box well i don't give a damn about that <laughs> who won the who won yeah. the freaking fight you know I, I i had a terrible experience uh i was a young trainer probably well probably about 20 years old 21 years old, I was up in Catskill training fighters with Cuss, and I had my kids, I had my kids in the uh, the tournament up past Albany somewhere, 
and we're in the tournament and my kids were doing real well and there's one fight you know I, I he uh, obviously I thought my kid won but I thought he won pretty easily and he doesn't get it and I had learned how to give the exact right example to my kids yet I matured into that you know as far as not losing yourself a little bit and I went up to the judge I did it in a proper way I'm looking out for my fighter but it just got it it went it, it, it made a left turn when it should have probably made a right turn and I went to them uh, while he was still sitting there at the you know at the ring and people were getting ready for the next fight and I started discussing with him why he gave it to the other guy and all of a sudden I said your guy, he wasn't landing punches my guy was making a miss he said yeah but he hit your guys on the arm I said on the arm I said are you kidding me? Has anyone taught you that's not a scoring area? That's not a scoring blow? Well, Marciano did it, and he used to beat all those guys. I said, oh, my God, you're, you're freaking, you're whacked out. Are, <laughs> you, are you kidding me, you idiot? And um, we started arguing. I <laughs> tore the scorecards up and threw them at them. And, uh, it didn't matter for the rest of the night because we were escorted out of the arena. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I I don't think my point got across too well. But uh, and like I said, I had learned how to be a little more diplomatic, uh, as I as Cus reminded me when I got home that night. But uh, it, it just it, it was really to that point when the guy actually said. Marciano used to hit guys on arms, and oh my was, goodness! Oh my God! I was like, it was difficult to talk to me after that. Well, thank you, Dustin. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Appreciate thanks a lot, you. Dustin. Appreciate you as always. Uh, Record-setting fifteenth uh, appearance on the fight with Teddy Alice. <laughs> we appreciate you. As Let's always. keep it going, baby. Let's keep it going. But hopefully, I get some fight news and and come back on here. We yeah, can talk will about you come it. on as soon as you're here? Don't let yeah. Ariel scoop us on this, man. <laughs> <laughs> do what you, you. got to do, Dustin. We appreciate you and um, give our best to your family, please. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Teddy. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you, Dustin.